I take the Oscar with me whenever I can when we're speaking at an engagement so that other um, students and activists can hold it and take a picture and, and uh, have fun. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with Bill Protzman, a classically trained musician who uses his talents to help vulnerable populations like the homeless vets in San Diego. He really believes that and demonstrates that music does heal. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Liz Scott, who's been a practicing psychologist for 40 years. Her new memoir, This Never Happened, is about her life with two very difficult parents. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me, my coffee in my hand. So let's begin. Today we have a special treat for you. We are speaking with Melissa Burton, who is the Academy Award winning producer for Best Documentary Short for Period, End of Sentence, and CEO of The Pad Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the principle that a period should end a sentence, not a girl's education. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Congratulations on your Academy Award. Thank you. It still sounds surreal when you say that. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, what what an amazing accomplishment. Um, and I wanted to give our listeners a little background that you're an English teacher in LA and you ended up making this film. Tell us tell us the story about how this film got going. Sure. So it's been a project that's about six and a half years in the making and it's still going on and I am a high school English teacher and I'm also the faculty sponsor for an organization called Girls Learn International and Girls Learn International is an organization which seeks to um, give high school students a voice in the movement for equal access to education for all genders worldwide and girls uh, around the world are educated to a lesser degree than boys are for a variety of reasons and as part of Girls Learn International's program, they, they send high school students, uh, 15, 16 years old is the youngest you can go to the United Nations, to the Commission on the Status of Women, to participate as actual delegates in sessions where we discuss um, obstacles to girls getting equal access to education. And it was at one such conference where my students and I learned that one of the main reasons that girls um, drop out of school uh, is because of the lack of affordable and accessible hygienic pads um, with the onset of menstruation. And so because of staining a uniform, because of toilets that are far away and various other reasons, forced child marriage, they they quit school once they begin to menstruate. And so my students and I thought, that is not okay with us. We are we need to raise awareness about this issue. We felt ashamed and um, surprised by our own ignorance. It's something that should be so obvious and what should be um, education, of course, is is so important for advancement. And we um, 
perhaps because we're from Los Angeles, we immediately thought what we need to do is make a film <laughs> to raise I, awareness about this. I see. So you were involved in advocacy for girls and women before the idea of um, this film came along. You were, you were yes. sending your students to the UN. Yes, and uh, as an English teacher, I'll just say that, that, that I would see which students of mine just because we would read texts um, from various countries because I teach world literature where the heroes were often female or maybe where female figures were not getting uh, a fair shake at uh, society. I'm thinking of uh, Nora from Ibsen's A Doll's House. Um, I'm thinking of Hester Prynne from The Scarlet Letter. And I could tell by the way that mm -hmm. some of my students would react um, to the injustices that the female figures faced. I would say, hey, there's this organization called Girls Learn International. Mm -hmm. Are you interested? And lo and behold, um, they were very interested. And so uh, we we became this chapter at our school, which is Oakwood School in Los Angeles, and we started going to the United Nations and advocating for girls' education. It's amazing. And so I'm guessing you have quite a reputation in your high school. <laughs> yes, in my high school, it was a lot of fun. The day after we won the Academy Awards, I came to uh, my ninth grade class, uh, with the Oscar in hand and everybody applauded and it's pretty much was the show and tell uh, the show and tell feature oh. of school that day everybody came and got to hold it and touch it and see what it was it's heavy and, oh it weighs eight and a half pounds and where where does it live does it live in your home <laughs> it actually lives in a book bag um, from <laughs> my school because as part of the PAD Project organization, which is the nonprofit that sort of housed the funds to make the movie that the students and I all are a part of and students who have graduated continue to be a part of, we um, go to other high schools um, around LA and indeed around um, the United States. So I take the Oscar with me whenever I can when we're speaking at an engagement so that other um, students and activists can hold it and take a picture and, and uh, have fun. I, I know that this is probably impossible to put into words, but what effect has this had on your students? Wow. Well, they are very eloquent and each individual could... Um, speak to that probably, uh, you know, more accurately than I could, but can. But I will say that um, each of them has stayed with it so that the, the founding members of the PAD project who began the documentary as 15 year olds are now as 22 year olds and 24 year olds and 20 year olds. They're all. Um, uh, on the staff of our nonprofit organization, working on the marketing, the social media, um, traveling to uh, different places around the country to advocate. Uh, many of us have gone to the village of Katikara in the Hapur district of India to uh, see the machine. And so everybody has stayed with it. And one of the most beautiful things just for me to witness from my vantage um, as a teacher is that the older students have taken the younger students sort of under their wings. So there's there's a passing of the torch. And mm -hmm. I think that um, all of us have just felt grateful and emboldened by like, oh, my God, this really did happen. We, we sort of can't believe it. And so we feel responsible to encourage and support um, younger people who are now younger than they are because they were 15 when they started this movement. So I think they all feel um, a responsibility and also a joy in uh, bringing younger, younger voices because they started when they were young. Mm. Could you tell the story and describe to us about going to India for the first time with your students? 
Absolutely. So um, we went, so our director, Rika Zatab, she um, had filmed the installation of the pad machine and then the effect of the pad machine um, on the village community in a, over a six month period. So in other words, when she first went to film the first part of the film, I'm talking about um, the documentary now, period, end of sentence, she she captures, um, you know, the attitudes of the village and the community uh, before the pad machine is even opened and before the women are working at the machine. Then she traveled, then uh, she came back six months later to see have the attitudes um, toward menstruation changed? And yes, they have, remarkably. And what is the business model like? And what's happening in the village? Then, six months after that, we had our first cut of the film, our first film ready to show. And we had barely, we were able to screen it at the United Nations, which was a kind of full circle thrill for all of us and privilege. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the students and I went from the United Nations to um, the Hapur district to Delhi, where we were able to travel to the village and actually screen, um, period, end of sentence, screen the film for the women of Katikara for the first time. And we were very nervous. And there is a language barrier, so we are all English speaking. Um, they speak Hindi. We worked with an NGO, Action India, who absolutely facilitated um, everything. And they were our translators. Um, on the ground and we projected the film onto a bed sheet um, in one of the mm. homes and there were about 60 or 70 of us um, who gathered around and just just watched and we sat together and laughed and cried and it was it was one of the more profound experiences of my life and I know of the students lives as well. Oh my goodness, Melissa! I I I have chills right now trying to imagine <laughs> this and all of the emotions that must have been going on. It really was because it had almost seemed like we had been talking and communicating with Action India, who in turn were communicating with the women in the village, who we could see and sort of Skype with on some occasions if they would. The, so the the village where the documentary is set is about 40 um, miles, but like a couple hours away from from Delhi. But sometimes they were able to travel, so we could we could Skype, but and we communicated through a translator. But it it had this unreal feeling. So to actually go mm -hmm. to the village and touch the pad machine and hug the women and like see that mm -hmm. this had all happened was really um rewarding and magical and just uh, a a wonderful experience and i'm and the two women i don't know how many in your audience may have seen the film or not but there are um we're proud that uh sneha who's an aspiring police officer um in the film was able to come to los angeles for the oscar um, ceremony and also Suman in whose house the pad machine lives was also able to come and this was their first time traveling it was the first time not only in an airplane but the first time they had even left their village um, of Katikara um, they hadn't even been as far as Delhi so you can imagine the sort of culture shock uh but they, mm -hmm. they they were very excited about the trip to los angeles and we were able to have some of our action india team also come and so it, it was a great celebration for all of us uh, it's it's really unbelievable the ripple effect yes. that this idea has had on so many lives yes. even from what i understand some of the men in this town. <laughs> yes. I think for those who have seen the film, you'll see that the men don't even know what a period is, or at least don't want to say if they know. Uh, they think it's an illness that maybe happens to women. And by the end of the film, the men of the village are engaged in uh, working on the machine and making pads. One of them says, I made a good pad. Mm, and at, at first... 
Am I right? Uh, it was, they thought they were making Correct. diapers. Correct. They thought they were making Huggies diapers. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that was their entree. And then they... <laughs> they learned the exactly. truth and how was that it's actually been uh wonderful and it is something that we didn't it's something that we discovered as one of the best outcomes we could hope for with the pad machine which is to say that it sort of um shredded this kind of taboo which we have in the United States too around menstruation and so suddenly people are talking about it and and it's an accepted natural fact and so uh, whatever we can do here in the United States to uh, or anywhere to uh, tone down the shame associated with what is after all a natural and life-giving process is good. So, so we were very thrilled about that aspect of um, the machine. With all of this impact, and, and it's just amazing story, how is it for you to be an English teacher <laughs> at this point in your life? It's wonderful. Um, I love teaching, and people ask me, oh, are you still going to teach? And... Um, to be perfectly honest, there is a lot of work with the pad project and I, and I don't know how I'm going to, uh, do everything I need to do time wise, but I would, I would never want to, uh, not teach. There's a double negative for an English teacher, but, (laughs) but I would, because that's what keeps me in touch, um, with the students who make me braver and better. Um, and I love being in that community. So that's what, that's where it all sort of begins with me. So to step out of the classroom is just not something I really think about at this point. Hi, Zestful Agers. I'll be attending the International Federation of Aging's 15th Global Conference on Aging in November of 2020. And if you're interested in improving your understanding of age-friendly environments, debating solutions to address inequalities, confronting the reality of ageism, and delving into what it means to enable the functional ability of an older person, head over to ifa2020.org to find out more. There's an early bird special on until the end of the year, so take advantage and join me in Niagara Falls. I'll see you there. And and so are you continuing to work as a faculty sponsor for Girls Learn Yes. So Girls Learn mm-hmm. International is an organization under the auspices of the Feminist Majority Foundation and we continue to partner on other ventures to um to get pad machines to other communities. For instance, right now we're working on sending a pad machine to a woman's collective hospital in Afghanistan in a, in Kabul. So we're, we're partnering. I'm not, um, now because of the pad project and the documentary, my, my, um, work with the Girls Learn International and the Feminist Majority Foundation and as a faculty sponsor has sort of now it's it's I'm I'm the pad project lady you know so Mm -hmm. so it's not Mm -hmm. as broad as it was in terms of all of the um, advocacy that goes on with women's rights so but but I am I am focused on menstrual health management particularly now. And that's something that you've decided to continue focusing on. You're not looking for other projects that support um, girls and women. Well, so the PAD project, our mission um, is to uh, partner with local, locally and globally to end period stigma. So whatever that means, um, whether mm-hmm. it means so we're we're definitely behind issues in the United States. Um, we want to abolish the tampon tax for all states, get supplies that are free, menstrual supplies that are free for girls and uh, in schools, in women in prison, and 
have mm -hmm. um, all the things that the U.S. could do better. We want to do that. And at the same time, we are working with communities around the world who have expressed a desire for a pad machine in their community. So since, since the Oscar uh, win, and that moment on the world stage, we have heard to date from 94 countries from every mm. uh, continent uh, and continent and countries you might not expect um, wanting a pad machine uh, in their village or city or community. And the outcry and the response has been humbling and overwhelming. Um, we've heard and we've also heard from from countries and communities and institutions who who would love to partner um, and say, hey, we would like to sponsor putting a machine here. Um, we've heard from schools in the United States where um, you know, you don't think about it so much in the United States, but in fact, um, we've heard from several schools where the school nurse and teachers are paying out of their own pocket for pads and tampons for their students, and we certainly think there's no call for that. We know that in lower socioeconomic areas um, throughout the U.S., when free um, sanitary napkins uh, were given in dispensers in the bathrooms, attendance went up. So it's something we're, mm -hmm. we're committed to, um, supporting kind of a menstrual justice, uh, platform, you know, mm -hmm. across, you know, wherever we can, however we can. And that's why we need all these mm -hmm. students because they, they have, uh, they're the worker yeah, bees. Yeah, exactly. And they're brave. <laughs> they're, they're very brave. Oh. And you say uh, brave, you've used that word a few times, and I'm wondering what kind of resistance have you met? A lot, um, a lot. Uh, it is a sensitive topic in the United States and, um, and everywhere. And uh, it's a topic people feel uncomfortable talking about. And, and generationally, I realized that I had my own baggage with it so that, for instance, um, when the students um, would say, we want to talk about the PAD project at a school assembly and we're going to say what we're doing and we're going to do this. I actually, um, to my own embarrassment now, I would say to them, no, no, please don't do that. Because out of a certain protectiveness, I felt they would be the targets of embarrassment. And indeed, some of that has happened, but mostly Mostly, um, the school that we go to has been very supportive, but to kind of broaden the lens to the larger community, as we were gaining traction on the film festival circuit and when we were um, nominated on the shortlist and then down to the final five nominations for the Oscar, the Hollywood Reporter um, did a... Um, they do a feature every year where they have anonymous people who are members of the academy um, speak out about their votes. And there was a whole article from somebody who identified himself as a longstanding male member of the academy who definitely would not vote for period end of sentence because it was just, I quote, icky, icky. No man would ever vote for a movie to win an Academy Award about that subject. And that was published um, about two weeks before we did win the award. So I'd like to see that person and put the award mm. on his desk. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, there are definitely um, attitudes and, and feelings of mm. wrinkled noses and that kind of thing. And I suspect, I mean, that's... Um, I, I, whatever whatever's going on with that guy psyche who knows <laughs> but is there also uh, in some countries and some cultures are you pushing against cultural and religious norms a hundred percent absolutely in different communities and cultures and we want to be sensitive to that uh, there are some places where menstruation is just not talked about. Morgan Anthem, who is the inventor of the machine, says in our film, uh, he says menstruation is the biggest taboo in our country. When our director went to Katikara to film it, she found that 
uh, women had not, mothers had not talked to daughters, daughters had not talked to sisters or friends. It's sort of like you got your period and you may not know what was happening, literally. And then, you know, maybe a friend or someone would sort of give some kind of, um, you know, nod to it or say, but there's a lot of different beliefs um, throughout the world that it's dirty blood, that it's cursed, that you are dirty. And this goes back in Western tradition too, to uh, biblical times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking, I'm, I'm aware that in some um, sex in Judaism, yes. uh, peop- uh, women who are menstruating have to sit in, in a separate place in the synagogue. Right. Uh, that goes to the idea that uh, women need to be segregated for a certain amount of time um, when they have their period because they're considered unclean. And we find this in a lot of different religious beliefs so that um, you can't enter a temple, for instance, in the Hindu religion if you're menstruating um, because you're considered to be unclean. Some, mm-hmm. some cultures believe that you shouldn't um, be in the kitchen handling food. Um, um, oh, in wow. Nepal, there's a practice called Chalpati in which women, and it's outlawed. It is outlawed, but culturally it still happens where um, women are sent to menstrual huts when they are they have their period and they uh, sometimes die because the huts are so rudimentary and in extreme weather conditions, it's either too hot or they can die from heat. Or if it's freezing, they build a fire, the hut burns down, a wild animal gets them. So lots of things happen. um, And every year, unfortunately, I think the last statistics were that 12 to 14 um, women die uh, who have been sequestered uh, in menstrual huts with the practice of Chowpati in Nepal. So... There's, there's a lot of different things going on around the world with regard to uh, menstrual rights, and, and I think the biggest thing that we can do is sort of break the shame around it so it's not as though women need to start to feel um, like they, they have to be outcast when they have their period. It's the ultimate feminist <laughs> It really, that's what it's we It's what it needs to be. A, <laughs> it, it, I mean, you know, from the ground up, it's what it means to be a woman. Yes. And it's just fascinating to hear you describe these practices that are still going yeah. on and still really speak to the uh, the fear and the misogyny in the world. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And uh, it's funny because... Um, Again, around the time right before leading up to the Oscars, people were like, this is your moment because of Me Too and Time's Up. And I'm thinking to myself what you just said, which is like, hello, this moment for for women and girls, you know, begins since the beginning of the human race. So it and and so Mm -hmm. this is where it all begins. And so if we can all at least begin to talk Mm -hmm. about it and appreciate differences that are bound to arise in cultures and religions, but also to, to make sure that, that women aren't being um, cheated out of an education, which is a basic human right, or their full right as uh, citizens to live a full life because of something as natural as a period seems, seems really essential. And it's essential, but I think that there's even more that's going on, which is with your work, Melissa, you're a culture oh changer. Oh my god! <laughs> I don't know. If I, thank you, but I don't know if I got. I mean, a, a, am I? Am I? Am I? What am I wrong? I mean, you are confronting these beliefs that have, you know, that are deeply held, and it, it's. It's one thing to bring in a pad machine, and uh, we didn't get to the part where there's an economic part that's really helpful and Mm -hmm, beneficial mm -hmm. and all this other good stuff. But, you know, this goes even deeper than, okay, now you can go to school because you have a sanitary pad. That that is that is true. I mean, ultimately. Does that freak you out a little bit? It does, it does, but in in a good way. It's a good freak out. Yeah. Um, Because. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's true. That, 
That felt very, what you're saying felt especially kind of real and profound um, in those first couple weeks, and still ongoing, because um, the the outreach the that we have experienced. Um, since that moment sort of on the world stage with the Oscars where just so many people can relate on so many different levels and have wanted to reach out. So it's just this overwhelming feeling of like, wow, this is really um, the time, a past time, overdue time for, for this conversation to be happening on a global level. Mm-hmm. You've gotten a lot of attention. I saw you were on The View (laughs) and interviewed by CNN and lots and lots of major media focus. Yeah, I think it's because um, it's so um, common that, you know, half of the, the population experiences a period, you know, and so, so I think everybody can relate to it. It's one sort of phenomenon that I, loved about this or that I continue to love about this whole experience um, which is touching is that a lot of fathers um, men have um, approached me or other people involved with the pad project to say hey thanks for for giving me a platform so that I can like watch the film and talk to my 14 year old daughter in a way that feels comfortable because I, I felt mm-hmm. shut out or I felt embarrassed or I didn't know how to talk about menstruation with my daughter or my sister, or maybe even my wife. And so to have a film where it's just kind of front and center has done that. And I think we have so many more allies too than, than, you know, I think I, just like the men in the village, I think men want to um, be helpful and supportive. And, and if it's out there in such a way that it's not a topic of shame or embarrassment, then I think that's a way for everybody to sort of uh, link arms and, and, you know, do this together. You know what? It just occurred to me as this is zestful aging. You know, many of the guests that I talk to are forty-five and over, or yes. we're speaking about the experience of people are forty-five and over. And as you well know, menopause is also that experience is also stigmatized. A hundred percent. Yes, absolutely, and it goes. So it's like, you know, getting it is a problem and losing it is a Absolutely. problem. Absolutely, and that's so tied in the United States anyway to your your power as a woman. If you're not, you know, seen as fertile, you're you're somehow less relevant than somebody younger, which is just upsetting. Um, and so I I see that as definitely linked also. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the, you know, the the experience of being female, it's yes. the, the theme yes. is, you know, what happens in the female body is problematic. It, it, you know, it's just a different version. Yeah, exactly. And this so, is, um, this may be too um, graphic, but um, a lot of people ask us, well, why not, why not menstrual cups, which you um, insert because they're, biodegradable they're they're possibly more economic depending and there's there's some sanitary reasons why that may not work in every community because you need you need clean water and other things but another uh, reason mm-hmm. is that insertion is related to virginity and sexual activity so that's another way so insertion would be taboo or uncalled for in many communities mm-hmm. because a woman's worth is still tied to her virginity. So, so that's, her that's a flip up. side of the menstrual, um, of the, uh, excuse me, of the menopause. So it's like your virginity and your fertility equals who you are when as all of your listeners know, and as we all know, we're so much more than that. So, mm. It's it's just a fascinating, fascinating subject. Do you want to leave our listeners with um, maybe some inspiration uh, in doing a project? And I know you mentioned uh, that you're 50 and you're doing a project that is 
Um, it's a really big <laughs> project. It's wonderful and yet has challenges. And many people in our audience are listening and thinking, hey, I've got a lot of years yeah. left. I'm 50 yeah. or I'm whatever. 50. How do I... <laughs> <laughs> and how do I embark on this when, you know, there might be some pushback right. um, and I might not feel confident and I might, you know, people might say, what are you doing that for? I appreciate that question and I appreciate this podcast so much because to be honest, um, for me personally, that has been a revelatory um, my age and my relation to the young people that I work with and all of this happening. So I would say your naivete or your innocence can be your biggest strength because as long as you're committed to your idea and you know that your idea is sound and just, you'll find a way. And I would say um, that include as many people and voices as possible. I know there's this thing of uh, too many chefs spoil the broth or whatever, but if, if you're making something really big, you need as many chefs as possible. So <laughs> you need, don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah, exactly. And so, mm -hmm. so I think that, that sometimes that makes things messier than if you've got a small group. It can make things feel out of hand. But, but when I think of the scope of all that has happened, I couldn't, you know, there have been so many people whose ideas and voices have been involved and, and every one of those has helped to bring it to the point that it's gotten to. So, so I would say, don't worry about what you know, just worry in terms of process, you know, because that will come and just just include as many voices and people and help as as you need and and go for it mm-hmm I love that that's really great advice like you don't have to figure it all out right you just have to take the first step yeah I mean I really think that you know I can identify that with the podcast I didn't know what I was doing and then I just started doing it right right and, then, and now look and then you learn that's right yeah that's perfect Melissa thank you so much for spending your time with us this project is in deeply inspiring and I I'm so happy to have gotten to uh speak with you about it today me too thank you so much for having me and thank you for your podcast which is very inspiring and I love it so I'm so excited to be a part of it Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at NicoleChristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. And next week, we're going to be speaking with Liz Scott, who's been a practicing psychologist for 40 years. Her new memoir, This Never Happened, is about her life with two very difficult parents and her realization in her 30s that their Martha Stewart lifestyle was a farce and that the family was actually from strong Jewish roots. 
So stay tuned for those great interviews. See you then. <music>